good evening everyone so i am hamsa kunyu many of you uh, know me because of the course so i am a climate scientist by profession and it's truly an honor to be moderating today's panel discussion on uh, climate change science and society so over the past few months many of you have been part of our journey through the climate change course uh, which is offered by luca science portal and kerala shastra sahitya parishad kssp so our aim was very simple it was to educate and raise awareness among the public about climate change so in our course uh, we touched on just about uh, almost all key topics related to climate change at least at a uh, primary level we explored the physics behind climate change talked about climate modeling and looked at uh, global and regional climate change impacts and we also had a special focus on how the indian monsoon is changing uh, which is very crucial to us i mean for uh, yes we also explored the ocean's role in climate change and how our climate ch climate has changed in the past and we also went deep into the into what ipcc report says especially the recent report ar6 and during the last two weeks we have been discussing solutions to climate change we had a detailed discussion on adaptation and mitigation and our last and ongoing session is all about moving towards low carbon economy so in short uh, we have tried to cover all the major areas of climate change in our uh, very limited time frame and uh, in fact uh, i believe i personally believe the course stands as a significant step in enhancing climate change literacy in our state and uh, it is especially remarkable that it was orchestrated by parishad kssp uh, an organization that doesn't need an introduction to uh, most keralites kssp has a, an illustrious history with the literacy movement uh, that transformed kerala into india's uh, first fully literate state and today uh, in the face of ever growing challenges of climate change uh, it is interesting to see KSSP is again at the forefront of promoting literacy, but this time on the climate front. So as we start today's discussion, our course focus will be multifaceted. We want to talk about the politics and socioeconomics surrounding the climate change. We will also go into the uh, kind of delicate balance developing countries like India must maintain between development and climate action. Furthermore, uh, we will go into the political intricacies of climate policies. We will emphasize the necessity for a fair and just uh, solution for the climate crisis. So to uh, guide us through this discussion, we have two distinguished panelists. Let me introduce our panelists, even though uh, they need a little introduction. Uh, let me introduce Dr. T. Jairaman first. Dr. Tyagarajan Jairaman, currently a senior fellow at uh, Emma Swaminathan Research Foundation. He started his illustrious academic journey in theoretical physics. It's uh, pretty interesting. He earned his PhD from the University of Madras uh, for over a decade. Uh, from 91 to 2003, he made significant contributions in this field. And he holds important roles at the Institute of Mathematical Science in Chennai, including as a professor in theoretical high energy physics. In 2003, he expanded his horizons, joining the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai as a visiting scientist, where he collaborated with both the theoretical physics group and the School of Mathematics. By 2006, he transitioned to the Tata Institute of uh, Social Science in Mumbai and remained there until 2020, I think. So Dr. Jairaman's research has evolved over the years, moving from pure physics to interdisciplinary studies that uh, bridges science with social issues. Today, his work uh, encompasses a wide range of topics from climate change and its poli policies to the broader implications of science and te technology in the society. Uh, he works particularly within the uh, Indian context too. So with his unique uh, blend of pure science and its societal implications, Dr. Jairaman brings a holistic view to our discussions on global uh, climate challenges. So that's about Dr. T. Jairaman. Welcome. 
and uh, let me introduce professor uh, vijay prashad professor vijay prashad is a distinguished historian journalist political commentator and a noted marxist intellectual holding a phd in history from university of chicago in 1994 his academic pursuits and contributions are really vast from 96 to 2017 uh, Professor Prashad enriched the corridors of uh, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, as the George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian History and a Professor of uh, International Studies. His depth of knowledge and keen insights have made him a respected voice in the contemporary discussions. In addition to his academic achievements, Professor Prashad wears multiple hats in the world of journalism and uh, research. He serves as the Executive Director of the Tricontinental an institute for social research and he's the uh, he's the editor of left word books as the chief uh, correspondent at uh, globe trotter his writings reach a broad audience offering critical perspective on pressing global issues i should also mention that professor prashad's voice resonated globally when he delivered a compelling speech at the glasgow cop 26 highlighting the pressing climate and socio-economic challenges from a very unique perspective that combines history, politics, and uh, economics. With a body of work that spans authorship, journalism, and intellectual discourse, Professor Prashad stands as a significant figure in the discourse on South Asian history and uh, global political dynamics. So let's welcome Professor Jairaman and Professor Prashad. So, all right. So, so here is the plan for today's discussion. Our panelists will start with a uh, 15 minute presentation each. Um, uh, if you have a PowerPoint, uh, feel free to use it. And uh, after that, I will ask them some questions for about 30 minutes to go deeper into the topic. And uh, in the last 15 minutes, it's for you, the audience, it's your turn. Please type your questions in the chat box uh, with your name at the end. Uh, that will be more convenient. If we have time, we might uh, take a few quest live questions as well. So that's the uh, pretty much the plan for today. All right, let's uh, let's move forward. So I now I would like to hand over the virtual floor to Professor Vijay Prasad. Professor Vijay, please go ahead with your opening statement. You you got fifteen minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> firstly, thanks a lot for <clears throat> inviting me, and uh, I would I was hoping that Professor Jayaraman would go first because. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's really the expert in this field. I'm not a scientist. I'm an interloper. Um, also, of course, we all learn a great deal from him about uh, not only climate science, but climate policy. But OK, let me go ahead first. Um, in which case, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the debates around environment, climate, and politics, and give a little historical background so people might understand a little bit of some of the field of debate and inquiry on some of these issues. Um, you know, right after the, um, well, what do we call it? The corporate terrorism of Union Carbide on Bhopal in 1984, um, you know, many of us were very dismayed and, and I mean, quite shocked by the scale of that, um, of that industrial accident or industrial um terrorism whatever you call it uh, obviously it wasn't something out of the ordinary um indian industry even at that time uh was pretty ruthless with uh human beings with nature and so on but the scale of what happened in bhopal was considerable and in the aftermath of that i remember looking for things to read to try to understand um you know the the quote unquote behavior of capitalist firms um, I came upon the work of a little known economist. Um, his name is Carl William Knapp, Cap. Um, in fact, his book published first in 1950, The Social Costs of Private Enterprise had been republished in Mumbai by Asia Publishing House. In those days, Asia Publishing House used to publish a range of books. Um, it was republished in 1963 as The Social Costs of Business Enterprise. Um, it's an interesting book. Cap himself had been a great critic of the Austrian school. Um, 
he was sympathetic to Marxism, but not himself a Marxist. Anyway, the broad argument of the book is that capitalist firms um, strive to externalize as many costs onto society as possible. For instance, if you are a firm that's processing chicken, for instance, um, you want to have the chicken bones and the blood and you know the bits that are not going to be sold thrown into a river. And you allow um, society, in other words, nature to pay the cost for, um, for those costs. I mean, those costs are borne by society. They're borne by nature. A cap argued that these social costs would be routinely externalized as much as possible by capitalist firms. They have no incentive to internalize the costs, you know, to bear the costs of cleanup of, of their own enterprise. And then, you know, in a way influenced to some extent by the development of state policy uh, over the course of the 50 years prior to him writing that book, publishing it in 1950, Cap argued that here's the role of the state. The state has to regulate, um, you know, private enterprise, which has a natural tendency to externalize um, social costs, externalize costs onto society. So the state has to try its best to make sure that private enterprise, um, which has this tendency to externalize costs, internalizes as many of those costs as possible. It's interesting, this book was written, published in 1950, quite a long time ago. Um, it was really a marginal part of mainstream economics. Not many people paid attention to Cap. Um, his work was not really taken seriously. And the concept of social costs and externalities, you know, it's a 15 minute part of a introduction to economics. It's not really taken seriously, even now. Um, it got some revival in environmental economics. People started to pay attention to some of this stuff, but it's not really, um, you know, uh, disturbed the broad field of environmental economics or even economics in general. Uh, the main point that Cap makes, which is, of course, evident to any Marxist, is that a capitalist firm driven by competition, driven by the need to make profit, um, is not going to want to internalize costs. It's going to try its best to externalize costs, damage um, humans as much as possible, damage nature, um, put the planet into peril. That's the tendency of capitalism. And Cap, who was not a Marxist, nonetheless uh, came to those same conclusions as any Marxist would come. Um, now, interestingly, Simultaneously with Cap's kind of political economy of the destruction of, of, of nature and of humans by capitalism, simultaneous with that, but of course with a much longer history, is a kind of romantic strain uh, of environmentalism, which, which begins, of course, in the 19th century. The horror of British industry compelling poets like William Wordsworth going for walks in the Lake District, um, talking about a time when when the air was cleaner, um, when you know there was not sludge on the street, uh, when workers were not coughing as they walked past you, and so on, um, a deep environmental, uh, a deep romantic strain um, develops not only in in Britain, uh, in of course in 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 the United States with Henry David Thoreau, uh, with Ralph Waldo Emerson, certainly in Europe, in Germany, a strain that goes directly into Nazism later, a conservation preservation as the antidote to the natural tendencies of capitalism, which is to, of course, destroy um, in order to make profit. So there's this long strain of romanticism, uh, which in fact defines much of the environmental movement today. Um, it's two contours of preservation and conservation. You have a, this strain of romanticism in environmentalism today that, for instance, says don't remove um, you know, rare earth minerals from the ground, leave it in. The concept extractivism, which, you know, has a very uh, kind of, it has its roots in preservation, in conservation. Don't touch it. And often that lecture is given, of course, to countries of the global south, uh, to Bolivia. Don't touch the lithium, leave it in the ground. Um, don't touch the cobalt in Democratic Republic Congo, leave it in the ground. This has a long tradition that comes from 19th century North Atlantic romanticism, you know, again, the two contours being preservation and conservation. Um, after World War II, after Cap had been writing, you know, about um, social costs of business enterprises, how capitalism's, um, you know, basic structure 
is in fact not to preserve, not to conserve. In fact, it is to destroy the environment unless it is somehow compelled uh, by social principle, by the state, or by a concept, um, you know, a social structure called socialism. And you transcend capitalism. Um, that's what Cap was writing about in the 1950s and 60s. Around this time, that deep strain of environmental romanticism um, is given shape in Rachel Carson's tremendous book from 1962, Silent Spring. Now, the book is tremendous because it's a beautifully written book, very compelling book. But again, it comes from this romantic strain. It has a um, deep impact on the consciousness of a lot of people, particularly in the North Atlantic states. It, there's almost a direct line from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring to Earth Day in 1970. And then effectively, as the pressure builds uh, for the Stockholm Conference, the UN Conference on Environment in 1972, um, there is this deep strain that exists um, of preservation, conservation, the antidote to the destruction of the environment, um, to environmental crimes, is not to question the social system of capitalism, not to understand how the productive forces um, can be compelled and transformed into something that is not as destructive uh, to nature and to people, uh, but nonetheless isn't a reversal, a U-turn back to some fantasy land of the past. Um, that strain of protection, of preservation, conservation, continues right into the UN environmental program, uh, drawn from William Wordsworth, Rachel Carson, and then into the U UNEP, at least sections of the UNEP. Things change very interestingly, and I want to focus principally on this, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, I remember traveling first to Cuba during the special period in the 1990s. Very difficult time for Cuba. The Soviet Union had collapsed. Um, the Cuban Revolution was uh, under severe threat. Uh, people in India might remember that um, the CPIM and, and the CPI and others, Kisan Sabha raised, um, you know, tons and tons of grain and put it on a ship called um, Princess of India, I think it was called. Uh, the ship carried grain to Cuba at this time. Harkrishan Singh Surjit went uh, to deliver the grain with um, M.A. Baby in Havana to Fidel Castro. And for a week, all the, the bread in, in Cuba was um, made out of Indian grain. It was called the bread of India. Anyway, at this time, great struggle and suffering in Cuba. Um, nonetheless, the Cubans were experimenting with different forms of agriculture, uh, using complicated ways to fertilize the fields and so on, because they didn't have access to chemicals. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what happens in 1992. In 1992, um, the world's, you know, 154 countries go to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil for the uh, so-called Earth Summit. Um, it's important that this was held in Brazil. It, it's also important to know that Brazilian agriculture or agribusiness is extraordinarily polluting. Um, Brazilian soil is said to be some of the most toxic, some of the most polluted soil in the world, which is why the landless workers movement in Brazil puts so much stock on agroecology or organic farming. Uh, not because you know they are necessarily coming from a romantic perspective, but because the soil has been so damaged by over um, the chemical usage. You know, um, it's, it's, it's said to be the most toxic soil. Anyway, they met in Rio in 1992. Imagine this. Um, this is a period when almost all of the third world is surrendering to Western imperialism. You know, India has gone in July of 91 to the IMF. Manmohan Singh writes a very servile letter um, to the IMF from Bangkok, in fact, uh, saying that we're going to liberalize, open up the economy. Most of the big powerhouses of the third world, Egypt, India, um, you know, Ghana and so on, had all gone the road of surrender. Uh, to Western imperialism at this time by, by 92. And here's Fidel Castro ca strides into this conference and gives one of the most amazing, remarkable speeches. It's about, um, you know, just about three, 400 words. I highly recommend, um, Hamza, that you circulate Fidel's speech. It's only about 300, 400 words, very short. What Fidel says is a couple of things. You know, firstly, Fidel puts on the table the kind of let's say Marxist, but also Karl Knapp's um, perspective on external externalities. He says that, look, you know, the imperialist bloc has destroyed the planet. You've got to own up to this. 
Uh, it is your history of clear cutting forests. It's your history of um, you know smokestack industry without care for where the smoke goes. You know this was a time of greenhouse gas uh, debates and so on. He said, you know, you have technology to clean up the smoke. Uh, you can uh, put various filters on smokestacks. You didn't bother because it was it would mean that you'd have to internalize the cost um, of cleaning up the air. Uh, you just don't bother to do all this. You externalize the cost to the planet. You destroyed the colonized parts of the world. You clear cut mahogany forests in India and Indonesia to build rail flats. Um, you know, uh, you had your share of the destruction of the planet. Um, the planet has to be saved, he says. You know, he says that we are at a point where the one species that's prepared to go extinct is man. Uh, that's how he starts the the speech. Um, the planet has to be saved. Look, these two things: one, you destroyed the planet. Secondly, uh, we are starving and we require development. And and third, the planet has to be saved. All these things are true. You know, uh, it's not a question that well, you destroyed the planet. Now it's our turn to destroy the planet. It's not a callous attitude, a formula of callousness that's put by Fidel at this conference because Fidel leads the charge. And it's because of the work of the Cubans at that conference and others, I must say, it's not only the Cubans, but Fidel really went ahead of everybody. That two principles are put in place at Rio. And I really want to um, share them with you and then I'm going to close. Uh, the first principle is the principle of common and differentiated responsibilities. The idea is pretty simple. We live on one planet. The destruction is commonly felt, obviously with uneven effects. Certainly, low-lying areas are going to get hit more, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a common experience of climate change, just as the pandemic was, you know, in one sense, common. Although, again, differentiated effects. Some people got vaccinated, some didn't, and so on. But there are differentiated responsibilities. And here comes the second principle, which is not talked about much anymore. Common and differentiated responsibilities on the agenda. The second one is pay, the polluter pay principle. Um, if you pay, if you pollute, you pay. And that comes back to Cap's um, theory of social costs. The polluter must pay. And in a sense, we have historical records. IPCC has records, others have records of historical abuse of carbon budgets. Um, the polluter pays. Where is um, the climate? Fund, you know, wh where is the money for that? It simply hasn't been put on the table. We are in danger of allowing the romantic strain of environmentalism to suffocate this other strain, the strain that comes from CAP that's there in Castro, and one that I think we need to pick up. So I, I want to end here, Hamza, with just saying there are two lines, two approaches at least, probably many more. Um, but I want to say beware of the romantic strain, preservation and conservation. It is a deceitful and duplicitous uh, mode of, of thought historically. Um, but study the one that talks about social costs, that talks as Castro did about common and differentiated responsibilities and the polluter pay principle, because those are treaty obligations now of the world. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, so now we can, Professor Jairaman, are you, are you there? Yeah. Yes, please I go am. ahead. Let me begin by pointing out that uh, the problem of global warming is the problem of the excess emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. So this is the first problem. Now, please. Uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that it is the excess that I am talking about because all the greenhouse gases that we are talking about, the majority of them, are part and parcel of the natural course of life on Earth as well. The primary greenhouse gas, and this is very important to underline, is carbon dioxide. But carbon, through carbon dioxide and the global carbon cycle, is essential to life. Life as we know it, in its transition from to the carbon cycle and carbon-based life, 
is essential to the way we see the planet. Life both originates in the conditions of the planet and it also shapes the planet itself as it evolves. So there is a difference between calling it a pollutant in the standard sense, like say mercury or lead, etc., and climate change, this global warming due to greenhouse gases. That's number one. The second point about global warming is the origins of global warming in carbon dioxide excessively produced. Excessively is a relative term uh, beyond the pre-industrial level is a correct term and produced on a scale that is unprecedented because of the industrial revolution and the fact that the industrial revolution the source of energy was fossil fuels first it was coal and in time it became oil and gas now what were the fuels before that the fuels most commonly used before that were biomass and the biomass from uh, forests and trees and wood biomass basically but also animal and vegetable fat so for instance uh, i with as uh, authors have pointed out the growth of productive forces that we witnessed in the industrial revolution if it had been powered by wood and whale uh, fat, which was a predominantly used fat in parts of the world, or through vegetable fat sources of uh, oil, we would have probably made possibly as much, if not more, damage to the earth. So, fossil fuels in its time helped to preserve the existing uh, forest cover and the animal resources of the planet. So what we see with fossil fuel uh, leading to global warming is a genuine contradiction in the development of productive forces, which is an inevitable part of the development of uh, human society, even if it takes place under, uh, you know, very uh, uh, very deleterious or very unequal relations of production. So the very industrial revolution that makes possible the great development of productive forces, which have the potential, not uh, which have helped they realize, though never to the full potential, the betterment of the human condition this very development threatens also eventually to overwhelm our uh, safety of our life on this planet. So I emphasize this because if you say carbon dioxide is a pollutant, then no pollutant has a, you have no right to pollution. You can say you can delay your uh you know efforts to reduce pollution because you do not have the resources you are very dependent on it in some form etc etc these are well known arguments but there is no fundamental right to pollution on the other hand if carbon is also a resource uh, 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 the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere a kind of global commons, then of course there is the whole question of an equitable share of a global commons up to of course the limit where it is uh, safe. And of course beyond the point, if it becomes dangerous, there is no question of a right to it. But on the other hand, the, <laughs> the consequence of the developments of the industrial revolution are precisely the fact that uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, have a limited resource uh, in terms of carbon. And how is this global commons 
a carbon space, so to speak, to be equitably shared. Now, this was something of a abstract, perhaps even uh, too abstract a solution without a definitive uh, sort of, shall we say, climate science answer to it. But this, in the developments of the last 10 years or 12 years, have established, uh, developments have established that we can think of a global commons, not merely in terms of concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as we started, which is a somewhat, uh, it has certain issues, but the one simple, elegant way to think about it is in terms of the global carbon budget. So the global carbon budget for a given temperature increase above pre-industrial level is the extent to which carbon dioxide can be cumulatively emitted. Okay. And that cumulative thing is a definite number. So you can say roughly it is 0.45 degrees centigrade increase in global average surface temperature okay for the emissions of uh, 1 trillion tons or 1000 gigatons of carbon dioxide so if you so for 1.5 degrees there are some complications in this story but let me skip those for so far uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, temperature increase, there is a carbon budget. For 2 degrees, there is a larger carbon budget. Now, if this is a global commons, this global commons has to be equitably shared. So sharing the global commons, sharing the global carbon budget is the basic problem that faces countries when we decide how is it that we are going to face the challenge of global warming. We cannot turn our backs on the benefits of the industrial revolution. Not all of what is possible uh, today with technology is possible without fossil fuels. There are many areas, many sectors, which still require fossil fuels. Secondly, transitioning to away from fossil fuel use is also expensive. I am not simply talking in terms of whether it is a capitalist economy, even otherwise, there will be, uh, you know, production has to develop, productive forces has to develop, and all of this will take time. So, you know, it is not that we can overnight transition. So, there is a whole issue of the material well-being of all people on this planet, of all countries, of the peoples of all nations. So, the question is, how should this be equitably shared in a fashion that we obtain the benefits of industrialization and therefore modernity, let us not forget the social aspect, for the world's population at the same time while we keep the safety of the planet for our existence. Now, many people have this view that uh, we will, uh, we have to save the species. Now, I would like to point out that uh, Yes, we should not, uh, humanity should not willfully destroy species. But at the same time, this idea that we have to preserve ecosystem is a little complex because if even if humanity is not there, what we call ecosystems will continue. It is not, if the only thing is they will not be what we are familiar with. They may be drastically modified. But nature continues its path, objective material world continues its path of evolution. Only thing is, we are not part of the story. So please remember, environment is always an anthropogenic conception. So 
the challenge before the world, and this is exactly reflected these days in climate negotiations, is what is the means to equitably share the global carbon budget? And in so doing, how is it that we maintain the necessary material increase in material well-being for all sections of the planet? At the same time, keeping the planet safe for humanity and therefore for the natural resources that sustains. This is something which is the challenge. And from the beginning, if you look at the... Now, of course, this has taken some time to evolve in a definite scientific sense. But uh, since uh, the sixth assessment report, the IPCC accepts the notion of the carbon budget and uh, related issues. Now, what is the history of the negotiations about? In the negotiations, obviously, this is not how uh, the so, uh, problem is framed, even though the idea of the atmosphere or carbon space as a global commons is much older than the scientific idea of the global carbon budget. In fact, it goes back to the 1990s itself. And uh, in fact, one version of it was articulated by Anil Agarwal and uh, uh, Sunita Narayan themselves. There's a Danish group which uh, worked on it. In, in fact, even a Pakistani minister of science and technology once wrote about it quite uh, well. So it is an old idea, the idea of the global commons. But the idea of the global commons has always been resisted. The sort of cumulative effect of emissions has always been resisted by the developed countries because of two reasons. One is, it is uh, obviously that you don't want to talk about the responsibility you have in the past. So the fact that you appropriated a greater than fair share of the global commons is obviously those who have appropriated don't want to acknowledge. It's very clear. That is an obvious problem. The second problem, a little more subtle, but related uh, to the whole issue of challenge of environmental economics is that it, the tradition of mainstream economic theory is conditioned to think in terms of marginality. So incremental development. Whereas the problem, the underlying challenge of the uh, global warming is cumulative stocks you know, cumulative amounts of emissions. This is a problem also in biodiversity and conceived in all problems of, you know, deforestation, overfishing, in all of these. It is the marginal approach which privileges the incremental advance of today without accounting for the fact of, uh, you know, what has been preserved and continues to be preserved, whether in a good way or not so good way, is not taken into consideration. For instance, everybody is concerned about deforestation in Brazil, in Rwanda, Indonesia, etc., which is correct. But at the same time, somewhere in the balance, you should say that in Europe, basically, there is no biodiversity to preserve. Okay? Or, and so it, you want the pollution to be nationally responsible. But where there are sinks which absorb carbon, there you insist that it is a global public good. So it is a very sort of, you know, hypocritical game which is played. And this is also, I think I repeat, fundamentally because Mainstream economic theory cannot think of stocks, but has this whole marginal attitude to all issues. So over the years, in a fit of enthusiasm, and I am really, it's a very strange coincidence that somehow or the other, that the UNFCC climate convention got passed. 
If you try to create the UNFCC today, I guarantee you it will fail. There was a particular conjecture where equity and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities was enunciated. This was a great triumph. If you look at the text of the convention, this was a great triumph of the developing world, the G77 plus China, as it is known today, uh, a distinguished negotiator from uh, India, Dr. Chandrasekhar Dasgupta, a foreign service person and an IFS senior, IFS official, has written very beautifully about it. Uh, it is available uh, online in the literature. And uh, this was a principle that we fought for and enunciated. So India has a long tradition of standing behind the principle of global equity in the climate convention. And whatever the ups and downs of our policy, whether international or domestic, we have continued to be seen, rightly so, I believe, as champions of equity. And uh, I am uh, quite uh, sort of, you know, uh, quite proud of the fact that uh, whatever work in uh, some small way that my colleagues and I have contributed to the question of equity stands in this uh, quite distinguished tradition. So we are talking about uh, a global issue. We are not here, of course. There are domestic differences on uh, how we interpret this, how we implement domestic policies. That is correct and that has its very important place. But this should not obscure the importance of global equity. The problem of global warming is intrinsically a global collective action problem. It is not like water pollution. See, if there is excess fertilizer and it runs off into your local lake, you can solve it. It's a local problem. There may be difficulties in solving it. You may require resources to solve it. There may be uh, problems. Your food security versus your water purity may have trade-offs. This may be complicated. Yes, all of that is true. But it is not a global problem. But carbon dioxide is a global problem if it is emitted in the United States. I can be as self-sacrificing as I want in India. It marks not an iota of difference. So the cumulative emissions of South Asia until 2020, the IPCC has put together the data and you find that it is actually what is it? It is 4% up to 2020, our share of cumulative emissions. Now, this is not an occasion to pat ourselves on the back because this is also because of our very low level of industrialization, our very backward uh, uh, industrial system across South Asia, I repeat, not only India. So 24% of the world's population has contributed only 4%. Now, some people like to say that, uh, you know, oh, but what about the rich Indians? They are also contributing to the problem. Rich Indians are also Indian. So the contribution of the top 10% of the world, which contributes something like uh, a major part of the world's emission, India's contribution to that is only about 1%. So India is not a problem. Unfortunately, the issue is the people who are the problem are not willing to reduce their emissions to stay with or at least in some way compensate or at least what remains of the global carbon budget of which very little is there for 1.5 degrees centigrade, four fifths of the global carbon budget is exhausted. Only one fifth remains, and we will run out of it at the current rate into seven to 15 years. We are going to run out of it. If you take two degrees centigrade, we have more time, but we have two thirds was exhausted by 2020. So, this is where we are, and this fundamental fact 
one of our minimal responsibility for global warming. So don't we should not pretend, and I say this in all seriousness, that we are the source of some global solution to the climate problem. We should be seen as helping. I agree with that. We should do our part, but we should not exaggerate our capacity to change what is happening in the world in terms of actual climate action, number one. And therefore, our call for equity remains always important. Number two, we have a large population which will be affected by climate change and for which development, human, social, economic development is the first defense against the impact of climate change. The whole concept of vulnerability arises from the fact that it is development that ensures that you are able to withstand the rigors of uh, climate uh, variability. So this extent to climate change also. So this is the second part. The third point is that we must also, however, live with the reality that the carbon space available for us will not be what it was was well available to develop the countries to even countries like China. And therefore, in the way ahead, we have to strive for low carbon path of development. This does not mean we pretend we can be global leaders in renewable energy tomorrow. That is not possible. We must be realistic. But at the same time, there is a deep question of our people's development, of our national of the guaranteeing that we are a nation with basic standards of material well-being, making room for our people's aspirations. This challenge has been exacerbated and sharpened greatly by the current threat of global warming. So I think I'll stop here. Perhaps I've crossed 15 minutes. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll stop here and then more specifically about negotiations, etc. Maybe in questions and so on, or in audience questions, we can explore. Let me stop here. Yeah, sure. So uh, let's start our uh, uh, discussion part. So since you talk about uh, both of you talk about common but differentiated responsibilities or CBDR. So uh, it has been a cornerstone of uh, international climate negotiations since the establishment of UNFCC in 1992. But uh, CBDR recognizes that while all countries have shared obligation to uh, address the environmental degradation, they have different capacities and levels of responsibility based on their uh, developmental context and uh, historical emissions. So. Uh, if we observe the evolution of CBDR across various uh, UNFCC co-op discussions, I mean, through the timeline, do you sense a deviation from its core principle that lie at the uh, heart of UNFCC's foundation? Uh, why I'm asking this question? Because uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, legally bound developed countries to uh, emission reduction targets, and uh, it actually embodies the uh, CBDR principle and developing countries were not subject to such uh, binding targets at that time. So uh, actually this distinction was uh, clear and uh, crisp uh, and it, it was directly in line with CBDR principle at that time. But it seems in the subsequent meetings and agreements, the, the difference, the demarcation between developed and developing countries uh, starts to blur a little bit. So, how do you interpret this, ev this evolution? Uh, are we uh, really undermining the original spirit of uh, CBD? So, uh, that's the question. Uh, I am expecting both of you to uh, take that question. Maybe Professor Jairaman can uh, start. Okay. Uh, so, let me go first on this. Uh, see, you see, uh, uh, first I want to point out that uh, uh, 
with great wisdom at the beginning we managed to get the phrase based on the principle of equality equity and common but differentiated responsibility in the light of respective capable uh, base and the respective capabilities okay so if you take cbdr and rc as it is called cbdr and rc if without the equity it is not complete many countries argue in the international arena that the two are the same cbdr rc is the same as uh, equity and even worse after the paris agreement they argue that the phrase in the light of national circumstances which was added is covers all of it it is not true there are good reasons why these were separate because common but differentiated means how differentiated how common that is the question and that of course has to be based on equity this is i am putting it simply but you can elaborate this so the from the beginning this has been the sticking point and the moment the kyoto protocol got going after the united states sat on the head of the rest of the world made them accept carbon trading these that etc then they backed out of it and when they backed out of it they made it very clear the us senate in fact uh, voting on it made it very clear unless china and india accept the responsibilities emission reduction targets we will not accept so while cbdr rc is there and was operationalized in the kyoto protocol in a specific way namely binding commitments for them and uh, no uh, 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 binding commitment for developing countries the united states by the time it reached conclusion rejected it so that uh, the child was not bound to live very long and fortunate so what was their target they achieved this partly at copenhagen but put it into writing in uh, paris and that is every but nobody has a binding contribution everybody makes voluntary contribution you have to keep your promise but what promise you make is left to a process of gradual persuasion and increase based on whatever science etc etc this is the process this gradual increase uh, process is what is referred to now you will see in the media as the global stock take of the paris agreement but that is the second part but the first part is in paris agreement it became voluntary contributions for all why because mr obama knew that if he went to the us senate and try to get ratification for a target for a commitment which was a binding or otherwise in fact at durban five, four years before uh, four years before paris the countries had put forward a resolution to create binding commitments on all and that is why india got very little upset and various things happened let's not go into the details but actually it was a failure of durban that happened in paris no legal commitment on anyone all of us got to make voluntary contribution rich poor whatever so what do the rich do they make weak uh, contribution then you have to yell and scream you know please do this please do that then they make a little more in the meantime they have other commitments as part of cbdr rc and equity which we should not forget which is their commitment to provision of finance technology transfer and capacity building to use the language of the uh convention even that they are not fulfilling it took 17 years from 91 to copenhagen for them to provide the first target 100 billion us dollars eventually by 2020 for finance had they reached it no are they likely to reach it doubtful 
so this has been the story but on the other hand you must remember that it is not uh, they don't have the say all the time whenever they may try to <coughs> hide the question of responsibility but first of all the ipcc's own data speaks against it and secondly developing countries whatever our other differences do not allow them to forget so they were very triumphant after paris they said we have removed the responsibility responsibility only looking forward not looking uh, backward nothing of the sort at the climate negotiation developing countries are together on these issues so it has been a checkered history but i think it is part of a larger fight that uh, continues to this day cbdrc and the equity are too early to be written off if anything our scientific basis for those phrases has gotten incredibly more powerful and uh, so it remains on the agenda this would be my assessment sorry that was a bit long but i thought it necessary to clarify thank you yeah. professor vijay what's your take i think we should get another question i think jayaraman has answered uh, that this is in fact a question of power and just one factual thing it's worth people going and looking at the johannesburg declaration of the expanded bricks um of the entire declaration about 30 paragraphs are on environment and climate it's the longest section in fact of the declaration and the least commented upon um you know there's a lot of commentary on the expansion of bricks but nothing about those paragraphs one of the core points there is exactly what Jairaman talked about, which is the a question of common differentiated responsibilities and so on as the foundation stone of, um, of negotiation. So as the center of gravity in the world changes, as the West, the G7, the NATO countries have less um, opportunity to bully, where they, bully their way to Armageddon, uh, let's see what happens. This is a question of power. This is not only a question of principle. OK, yeah. Thank you. So uh, so I have uh, another question. It's like uh, uh, these developing nations or the uh, global south, uh, I could say, these nations are always at a crossroad when addressing the climate crisis, uh, particularly uh, given the historical carbon fo footprint of the developing world. Uh, these countries, they have a limited resource at their disposal, and these nations face a critical uh, choice, like should they focus on mitigating the climate change, uh, which largely caused by the actions of uh, Global North, or uh, should they prioritize adapting to the already uh, manifested and uh, uh, ongoing climate change impacts? So uh, how can developing countries uh, best prioritize between adaptation and mitigation when we talk about it? I mean, strategies to uh, like ensure most effective and uh, sustainable outcomes for those countries. Let me come in on this for a second, Jairaman, if it's okay. Yeah, just yeah. To say, right. yeah, no, just to say that you already made the point in your presentation very well, which is that if tomorrow India decides to go to complete carbon zero, I don't mean carbon neutrality, but we just stop everything. Everybody in India stops everything it's still not going to make an enormous dent you know four percent of the problem i think that point Jairaman has made very clearly uh india's contribution to quote unquote saving the planet should not be over emphasized and in fact in fact from um from tokyo paris this obsession with india and china and coal is part of the western obfuscation of the actual facts of the situation you know, this way in which they've, and I'm going to use a strong word, propagandize around coal, India, China, these three words repeated, you know, ceaselessly as if India and China and coal are the cause of the climate catastrophe. Um, this repetition, this propaganda um, has really influenced uh, thinking. Um, and I, I would just like to pivot to say from that, 
that maybe hamza this is not a choice you know maybe wh why should this be posed as a choice you know um, why can't a country like india with the ingenuity of the indian people uh, think about ways to develop uh, which is not going to replicate there's no necessary for path replication of say great britain uh, not very great anymore really it's a touching point very touchy rishi sunak got angry on a flight from london to washington with a reporter who said that britain is no longer of consequence he got very angry he said we are great britain i don't think so rishi and in fact there's a there's a there's a actual good argument to be made for britain to cede its permanent seat in the un security council perhaps france as well you don't need three north atlantic permanent seats in the security council one should be ceded to an african country one should be ceded to a latin american country that is to say if we retain the principle of permanent seats but anyway um there's no necessity of path dependence you know we can generate new ways forward uh, think about new ways to um, to develop the the capacity of the people both the productive forces and as jay raman said modernity the social aspect as well so i would resist hamza uh, i would resist the question i would say the question itself sets us in a trap on the one hand exaggerating the possibilities of india's contribution to save the planet and on the other hand in fact diminishing um, you know the necessity of 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 having issues like um, transcendence from hunger transcendence from illiteracy and so on to be fundamental to the agenda um, of a country like india you know a country like india it's a disgrace that when china just a few years ago was able to eradicate absolute poverty in india that's not even on the agenda you know uh, yeah. once again at the g20 we had indira gandhi's formula not garibi hatao which is what she said you know remove poverty but garib delhi se hatao uh, which is you know resettlement of people of the poor outside delhi in the case of mr modi they didn't even bother to resettle people they just put green screens uh, to prevent people from seeing the poor so it's a disgrace i mean you know uh, that we still have an agenda that isn't foregrounding the eradication of poverty um so i would resist the question uh, rather than then say that the question is is one that we must answer it's somebody else's question it shouldn't be our question we should set our own questions uh but let me take it yeah uh, in a slightly different way as i pointed out the uh, smallness of the global carbon budget that remains tells us that uh, we for us low carbon development is not a choice but is a necessity but unfortunately now what has happened is that we still lack the technical resources to make this uh, to take this idea forward for all said and done all government officials everybody in india the entire society we have a vague idea of how to do it but we need something more precise scientific and which we can all sort of uh, have a common idea about unfortunately we lack the resources for that and the projections of how to take this forward which is partly done uh with the, the tools of uh, climate physics mathematical economics and uh, energy uh, analysis on the one hand or also in qualitative terms the way the problem is conceptualized unfortunately this knowledge is also stamped with the perspective of the developed countries so how do they think of uh, how to reduce emissions all this stuff you hear about scenarios pathways india must reduce 43 uh, not india the world must reduce 43% emissions by 2030 where did this number come from if you open the box and look at how they actually produce such numbers all of them 
come by assuming a tremendously inequitable world for the future. So we have India climate models, we have physical models as uh, Dr. Hamza, you know yourself, we have uh, various models, monsoon models, etc. We still do not have our own take on our low carbon path of development and all the stuff you see, for better or worse, I'm not uh, individually criticizing uh, uh, various people who do this work, but as a community, all of this are borrowed from models developed by developed countries. And therefore, it comes packaged with their assumptions. So if you open the box and look at the IPCC scenarios for the future for mitigation, we find that all of it is about keeping our GDP marginal compared to the developed world, keeping the wealth assets and advance of the uh, competitive advantage of the developed world intact without any erosion. Our energy needs to be curtailed, not just emission, but our energy needs to be curtailed. This is the basis of the future they predict. We do not yet have an alternative. Some of us are working on such alternatives. We hope we can come up with more and more people will join us in this task. But we need a vision of equitable, low carbon development for the world, not just India. And unfortunately, we, the third world, the global south, does not have one. So that is so we are doing it how we are doing it hit and miss. In Hindi, as you say, Andazi. We are not stupid, no. We all have a rough idea what is to be done. Tomorrow, if people have to grow food, you cannot say emissions. Don't doesn't matter. Don't increase productivity. We'll say Tata bye bye. We have to look for our food security. We have to run buses tomorrow. All buses will become electric. It's okay in this city, in that city, 20 buses, 30 buses. We will also run electric buses. My foundation, we are concerned with uh, uh, environment. Our uh, last vehicle, we have only one vehicle. We spent the money and we bought a Tata Nexon electric vehicle. All these gestures we can do. But can we fundamentally overturn uh, the way we are going is very difficult. We do not have a clear vision of how to do it. The second thing is, in the mitigation adaptation balance, the question is where, who, and how. So currently, there is this tremendous enthusiasm for mitigation of all things in Indian agriculture. Now, I think among all the insults huh, that uh, the Indian farming community has got, and I say farming community, I'm not just talking only of small and modular farmers. This is absolutely the uh, last straw. India's mitigate emissions of 4%, I told, less than 4%. So how can Indian agriculture contribute more than that? So, so our footprint is minimal. India's agriculture emissions are 15% of our national emissions. And our national emissions are two uh, point something gigatons per capita, ca tons per capita. If the entire world, as Martinez earlier once remarked, if the entire world were to emit at the per capita emissions of India, then there is no climate problem. The world's uh, greenery will take care of the climate, uh, will the anthropogenic emission. So you see, we cannot have mitigation in agriculture. I am very clear about this. The one thing that makes me <laughs> really uh, get worked up on the question of climate change is when you say the Indian farmer is the source of mitigating carbon. And who is the first to change it? The Indian corporates. 
the indian corporates today are busy going around promoting programs for carbon sequestration where for carbon sequestration in indian agriculture so in agriculture we have to be at the forefront of adaptation we are very uh, lagging behind in new varieties new techniques if there is a slight increase in emissions as a result so be it we have to expand our irrigation network of course in a sustainable way but our future is of greater rainfall even is more erratic so storage remains the key in uh, water for agriculture so we need more irrigation this is the way we should go if you look at the western literature developed country literature all of this they call maladaptation and in fact if you look at the models they build only the oecd countries are taken as a group and called economy all the rest of us are middle east south asia far east asia etc we are all geographies for them so this is the crux of the problem and uh, i think uh, the important question in the balance of mitigation and adaptation is a indian corporates must demonstrably invest in innovation i don't want you simply buying technology i am shocked when the head of one of the foremost industrial houses in the country and i am not referring to uh, adani or ambani foremost uh, leader of an industrial house says india must accede and accept and adapt to the eu restrictions putting uh, carbon tariffs on our uh, exports why because uh, you know why because they have 60% of their value addition coming outside india <laughs> so indian corporates must invest in innovation in industry indian uh, corporates must chart a self reliant course we we have an ambitious 500 gigawatt of uh, renewable how much do you think we is uh, going to be run by indian solar panels how much are we just buying so self reliant ca low carbon innovation is the first duty of corporates their mitigation is key but on the other hand for the farmer for building our housing for infrastructure for social economic infrastructure we need to invest clearly and strongly with adaptation also in mind so i think that we have to think this through is not a subject i can exhaust for you in the course of this discussion but i really think that you know academics who are interested in this issue should really work to produce models of low carbon development that are equitable sustainable and answer the needs and aspirations of developing countries these do not exist and this is a challenge before i'll stop here okay thank you so i have a specific uh, question for professor prashad uh, so during your speech at cop 26 in glasgow uh, uh, which got a significant attention so you made a very strong statement that colonialism is a permanent condition and it lies uh, at the heart of the climate change crisis so could you get uh, go a bit deeper in this perspective because uh, for someone like me uh, who has a limited understanding of socio economic context i uh, find it kind of fascinating that discussions on climate change often uh, bring up colonial history as much as they do uh, of the capital capitalistic uh, world order so shouldn't we emphasize more on capitalism or should we talk about this colonial history how how these two concept interconnected in the context of uh, climate crisis well firstly hamza i'm not sure if i was the one who made the speech i gather it was an ias official so i don't know if i should be answering that question um uh, the most funny thing about that you know i don't generally lose my temper i'm super even keeled person but i really got annoyed that day and spoke with a little bit more aggression than normal 
unfortunately that begins to define you and um but you know i'm not a very aggressive person so that it's a funny it's it's odd to see that anyway um you see again i'm going to say to you let's walk away a little bit from the choice between capitalism and colonialism after all these are braided social processes um we don't have capitalism without imperialism you know these are braided social processes and in fact if we have time we can talk about um how capitalism has within it uh, this imperialist dimension um, but anyway set that aside you asked a very good and specific question here's the issue you know there are many ways to understand something like the neo colonial um system after the collapse of formal colonialism there are many ways to understand that i remember reading kwame nkrumah's very considerable book from 1965 called neo colonialism the latest stage of of imperialism nkrumah was the first uh, head of government in ghana a very important figure he was the victim of a coup uh, pushed by the united states in 1966 went into exile and wrote a number of books by the way this book neo colonialism was reviewed by the cia um and this is when he was the head of government and it's one of the reasons they couldn't him. they say that in the, in the file um they were very angry that nkrumah came out there and, and and basically from a position of a high official unraveled how dependency operated that countries that had been freed were still not able structurally to control their own resources control um their intellectual uh, abilities control uh, much of of in fact the productive forces they, they they were out of their control they were entering into situations of uh, permanent debt and so on but there's also the colonial mentality i mean just look at this look at obama's behavior at at paris which jaya raman talked about uh, the disregard uh, for people in the rest of the world you know the very fact that they pull the wool over the eyes and claim that they haven't done it i mean in kyoto the united states government negotiated with force to get their military off the books when it comes to carbon calculations um the united states military is the largest institutional polluter of greenhouse gases in the world uh, that's a, a report from brown university and yet their numbers are not part of the us national numbers that was something the us government did in kyoto complete disregard uh, for humanity you know in that sense it's that attitude you know where obama walks into the room and just lectures the chinese and the indians and says that you know you got to get in line because this is the way we see things that attitude is the colonial attitude which jaya raman also talked about you know this complete disregard um for the issues the the um the premises uh, the potential of having a conversation that goes between um preventing the complete destruction of the planet and yet um enabling countries like india china you know but the whole globe the whole third world really to transcend uh, the compelling problems that grip humanity um and that conversation between you know pre preventing annihilation of the planet and allowing for the transcendence from solvable problems um, that conversation is not allowed you know they, they are not permitting that conversation there's an arrogance there um they basically they, they were the ones who foisted um the the um you know the um the sustainable development goals through the un and then they just junked them when they were not valuable um, they were the ones who insisted on creating these this quantification of development um the 17 sd uh, gs and then they just said forget it it's not important to us anymore i mean you want a, a sensibility of of the colonial mentality look at the german green party which started out as a party to defend nature from a conservationist preservationist standpoint and nuclear and coal and so on today the german green party is perhaps the most right wing party in germany more right wing than alliance for deutschland they are in fact so committed uh, to the war in ukraine that they are willing to bring back coal uh, virtually into germany they, they are not going to shut down power plants i want joke to the german green politician you know you you are on such a death march uh, with this war against russia that you are willing to burn down the black forest and the politician laughed and said well maybe that's true um this is the attitude you know uh, again they have 
things that they need to take care of in their own countries you know uh, don't widen the autobahn uh, maintain your own carbon sink you know the black forest and so on but that's not important to them as long as their interests are being served and that's why i say this is a question of power um, and it's a question of power not only in terms of the social costs of business enterprise in other words capitalism but it's also a question of power in terms of the north south relations and it's dismaying to see so many um, people you know uh, academics um, thoughtful academics saying well there's no more north south divide you know there's just there's just a kind of global their global problems i think that is a very dangerous attitude this this attitude to say there are just common problems global problems those may be but what about the differentiated responsibilities to draw from that principle what about the power relations that allow obama to just bang into a meeting a, a conversation he was not invited to and just bully people and and yell at them and talk extremely callously um, that is the attitude that i think we are we are going to to face and i think now the west the nato countries are facing it and that's why I, I would insist look i don't think the brics is some socialist paradise where it's going to you know march us to to nirvana obviously not it's filled with contradictions um it's filled with complexities but i would ask people to go and read the johannesburg declaration pay special attention to the sections on environment on what they call sustainable development and so on because i think the power um, game is now joined you know for a long time uh, it was easy to walk in and 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 talk down to people now it's harder look at the g20 statement from delhi on ukraine the united states had to back down um you know in the face of pressure coming largely from the kind of expanded brics block and one final point about the expanded brics block it's really important to show that the expanded brics block is increasingly becoming opec plus with the entry of saudi arabia Iran, Russia already there, Egypt, and very likely Venezuela coming in next year. Um, that means that the major producers of energy are going to be inside the expanded BRICS. This is going to energize, um, let's say, a kind of international struggle you know, in these institutions. I I'm, I'm interested to see what happens in subsequent COPs. There will be a COP next in Brazil. I'm very interested to see what the Brazilian government of Mr. Lula who's committed to um, the, the question of both development and preservation of the planet. Very interested to see what kind of agenda they set. Yeah, I have a specific question for you, uh, Professor Jeremy. Uh, it's about, uh, it's a little bit uh, slightly different. It's about nuclear energy. We, uh, I mean, whenever we talk about nuclear energy and climate change, it's uh, often sparks debate and uh, and uh, it's always uh, 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 divisive, this discussion. So uh, nuclear energy has a potential for uh, mitigating climate change. Arguably, it surpasses uh, many other renewables, uh, particularly given its uh, minimal uh, greenhouse gas emission, it's uh, uh, no intermittency, or it's impressive energy density, or efficient land utilization, whatever. Uh, at the same time, we uh, also have this uh, uh, challenges regarding the safety and waste management and all, and uh, the public apprehension, all these things. So uh, weighing these advantages and drawbacks, uh, should we actively position nuclear power as a central solution in our climate change action plan? Especially I'm talking in the Indian context, or should it be taken off the table entirely? What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time because uh, with your permission, I also want to very quickly respond to the some of the questions on the chat. But yeah, sure. uh, I, my short answer is with climate change, given the uncertainties that we face for the future, I think uh, all eggs in one basket or saying this particular type of egg, not at all, is a bad idea. So I am not saying that this is uh, nuclear is a central solution, obviously not. There are relative roles for hydropower, solar and wind, depending where you are uh, on the planet, which country, and so also nuclear. 
I believe that there is now serious discussion about new methods, new technologies. And uh, even in India, these winds have reached us. Uh, what is currently discussed as small modular reactors uh, may not be the final answer, but without exploration, we don't know. Frankly, if you ask me, nuclear power is a better idea than ca carbon capture and storage which is talked so much in the context of climate change. Nuclear is more reliable and proven technology than carbon capture and storage. Is there a trade-off in risk? Unfortunately, yes, we are in a position where we have to balance one risk versus another. And therefore, while uh, nuclear power is not a magic bullet, the question of taking it off the table does not arise. Okay, this is my personal view. But with your permission, very quickly, yeah. I just want to touch on a few. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I don't want to preempt pre what Vijay would like to say. First, uh, with regard to the question about from Mr. Mohanan about capitalism slash industry. I'm sorry, my I thought I tried to make the point. Capitalism is not coterminous with uh, industry. I think industry, the development of productive forces can take place without necessarily is being capitalism in the form that we uh, understand it. So that uh, is so. From that point of view, I think uh, uh, this uh, the rest of the question can be answered. So deforestation for agriculture crops are a major contribution to global warming. That is in some parts of the world. And that is true. But of course, you know, we then forget the pressure of population. The uh, fact that Brazil with land reform could have done something to control uh, uh, deforestation and uh, answer the needs of small farmers. But you, given the agrarian structure, which has been bolstered by uh, imperialist powers, colonial powers, and then imperialist powers for a long time, obviously such solutions are hard to see. So I think however much you preserve the biomass of this world, all of it, try to increase it, it is not going to capture more than 15 to 20 percent of your global emissions. So, you know, biomass, yes, can help. It is something all of us can do, even if we are poor, plant trees, nurture, vegetation, etc., to the extent possible. But at the same time, without cutting industrial emissions, this idea of nature-based solution saving the planet is a misnomer so the question needs to be thought of in that language ha huh, the question on infrastructure see i have a uh, simple as uh, i think vijay has repeatedly made this point very well so adaptation let me make it in a particular way climate adaptation is not conservation Adaptation means you are able to sustain human life in a reasonably advanced and modern way, while at the same time sustainably using natural resources. That is adaptation. If uh, it is not adaptation to simply surrender, throw up our hand and say no industrial development is possible, infrastructural development is key to it, and of course, uh, there are challenges and there will be trade-offs. There and nobody is saying that Kerala should have a steel plant, for instance. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you need railways, a uh, high-speed rail, you will need it. Let me be very frank. I am uh, no secret that I was on the Kerala State Planning Board uh, in the earlier government. And if you ask me today, what is my opinion on things like high-speed rail? Yeah, yes, I think Kerala needs upgrading its infrastructure. The balance is it cannot be carbon neutral immediately, which uh, takes me to the Ramkumar's uh, somewhat uh, complicated question. So my short, if uh, 
uh, fun answer to Dr. Ram Kumar is, this is your job on the planning board to figure this out. How do we do this? But a more serious answer is, as I said, A, we do not have the real tools at the moment to do this. That uh, how do we, uh, on the one hand, use carbon space effectively as much as we can. But on the other hand, we are also transitioning towards low carbon uh, and renewable basis of energy. So that suddenly one day, we cannot have some sky high emissions and drop to zero in five years. Obviously, that's not possible. What is the balance? We are not very clear. And a lot of it has to come by investment in innovation, trying new technologies. And there, I think something is really possible. Here, I respect people's desire to be green, as they call it. I respect that. We cannot reproduce the ways of the West. But remember, don't decide as a middle class environmentalist for the majority of our poor. We need houses. We cannot have homelessness and poor housing on the scale in our country. Don't ask me to choose between thatched roofs and 1.5 degree warming and concrete houses and 1.7 degrees warming. That is not the way, as Vijay also pointed out, we should think of the question. So I think the protection, the we must abolish malnutrition, we must abolish poverty, we must answer not the minimum that SDGs give us. The SDGs don't even talk of abolishing all poverty, not just the minimum of SDGs, but we need to do a basis of material well-being. So there will be some rise in emissions while we are looking at new opportunities. But it requires a balance. For instance, I am not convinced fully by electric vehicles. I think we are spending too much on electric automobiles, not enough uh, attention to electrifying public transport. Maybe a metro is a better solution in the longer term, even if it's upfront infrastructure cost is high. So these are not well settled questions. With regard to panchayats and carbon neutrality, I would say, you know, your first priority in the panchayat, if you ask me, in any community that I live, my first priority is water, sanitation, uh, human development, better housing, better opportunity. Be a zero hunger panchayat. Be a zero malnutrition panchayat. Be a zero wasted children panchayat. Be a zero maternal mortality panchayat before you want to become a zero carbon panchayat. This is my appeal to Kerala. And I specifically address this to Kerala because this can be done. And if you look at the National Family Health Survey data on children in uh, Kerala, there is room for comp complacency. So let us be zero in all those indicators. Yes, then we will also say zero carbon, provided we have a scientific understanding of what that is, which we do not have at the moment. Let me stop here. Thank you. Yeah, I think we are almost uh, yeah time. I mean, maybe I could uh, ask uh, one common question too. I mean, maybe you can have your reflections on that. I mean, uh, if you look at the history of climate action, scope meetings, IPCC reports, whatever, um, what I observe is that there has been a shift in our priorities. Um, uh, however, I mean, whatever, I mean, whether it is good or bad, but there is a shift uh, I, what I can observe. Initially, the focus was clearly on the root cause, that is greenhouse gas emission from fossil fuel and uh, the global responsibility, the responsibility of developed world, and uh, all these things were there. But nowadays, uh, whatever there is in the report, uh, in the public discourse, it's most mostly about you know all these secondary solutions, like whether you eat meat or uh, your meat consumption or whether you uh, plan tea or your behavioral changes. The public discourse about climate change has been shifted uh, 
uh, very drastically and uh, and we are forgetting the elephant in the room so my question is all these businesses ipcc coop and all these things should we be more hopeful about this or uh, what's your take i mean it's a question to both of you vijay you want to go first well <clears throat> look you know sh sure um hamza the the thing is that there is a tendency uh, and i'm i'm sorry to talk like this in this kind of of uh, big sociological blocks but there is a tendency um in the social structure of capitalism to create atomization alienation of people from social uh, processes and so on you know this is a, a broad tendency which has been written about not only by marxists but has been very clearly observed by the at the origins of sociology by emil durkheim um, by george simmel and others looking at the european material this tendency towards atomization individualization and so on uh, in, in fact it's not that there's a there's a plot to make people less social minded there is a a tendency in the capitalist system it seems to have a effect on society where people are more atomized alienated individualized and so on um and this then works very well for uh, privatizing solutions um you know as you privatize goods you privatize solutions so just to pick up jayaraman's earlier point uh, i'll buy a uh, an electric car for myself not that we will have um, a different powered public transportation system i will recycle my garbage rather than we think collectively about the quantum of garbage produced and waste in a society i will eat less meat rather than think about how um, you know socially we are making choices in using uh, you know arable land do we want to grow fodder for animals that we eat do we want to have a seven year life of a chicken or a 48 hour life of a chicken you know the chicken industry is now able to create um, wrapped chicken from a 48 hour in a 48 hour cycle that's insane um not a, you know so many years of the chicken growing and whatever um but the point is this idea of both the atomization and individualization of human consciousness you know our thinking uh, the break from even family the personal choices individual advancement and so on simultaneously with uh, the privatization of of goods you know uh, buy your own car buy your own house buy your own this buy your own that uh, commodification of everything that results necessarily in the idea that solutions are privatized or solutions are individualized uh, this is not anybody's fault you know that why is this person such an idiot they believe that if they recycle their garbage they're going to save the planet it's not personal fault this is a social tendency it's a social trajectory we have to confront this not with arrogance and disdain saying how stupid you are to believe that if you buy a car you know we we, we so social change doesn't function through disdain and arrogance social change functions through building an alternative project that's what um, you know the people's movements are about that's what the left movement is about is trying to build compelling social projects social arguments against this idea of privatized individual solutions now it's important to know that privatized individual solutions you know uh, kind of anarchic solutions is itself ideological because at the same time large corporations are highly regulated managed and planned and they operate <laughs> with a planned structure so it's not like in capitalism everything is governed by individualized anarchic solutions that's an ideological claim which infects people's own sense of themselves in the world meanwhile of course giant corporations large countries major multilateral institutions highly planned highly regulated operate in a military fashion on the world but we have to build a social process where, where the where the classes of the workers and the peasantry and so on build our own social project that confronts both the ideological confusions of capitalism individuation atomization and so on and that highly regulated and planned machine which works against the interests of the vast majority of people so i would say that look i i also sometimes sneer at people who have these individualized 
solutions. But that's not the way we advance history. You know, our sneering is as individualized in private and in fact as ideological, therefore, as the individual actions of somebody. The only way to move a positive agenda forward is collectively with collective solutions, both operating at the municipal level, but also at the political level. People need to join political organizations. You can't change the world uh, by sitting at your computer. You have to be involved socially to change the ideological basis of individuation and revive collective and social solutions and social action. Thank you. And that uh, is a, a, a nice and I think very comprehensive answer. Let me just give one or two very simple examples. This is also, there is a huge bias in the world. Uh, first of all, for the kind of things uh, Vijay was talking about, I would say, think of the unemployment problem. The unemployment problem affects all of us individually. But how can we solve it by giving employment individually? Of course, there are people who say, maybe you should open your own business, be an entrepreneur, maybe even a tea shop will do, etc. But, uh, you know, that goes only so far. It's an economic, social problem. So that's the scale at which you should think about it. The second uh, uh, point I want to make is, you refer to ITCC and COP, and you see you are in danger of starting me off on another <laughs> angry terrain because it is amazing how this idea of everybody must contribute is taken by a world which does not simply have any idea of inequality in the world. What is India's per capita consumption of meat? Is on the uh, something like four kilograms per person per year. What is the world? Uh, maybe it is five now. No big deal. What is it at the global level? Forty. Last I the statistics I saw. What is it in the United States? It is. Uh, it was ninety and projected to reach 100, 110 kilograms of meat per person per year. So what are you talking of uh, food in diets? And you know, our vegetarians are thrilled. Have you any idea to overcome the protein deficiency of our country? Huh? How much pulses you will have to grow? As it is, we export it, import it like uh, crazy, and we are in trouble every year. There is a shortfall. Next year, we will import it because of the possibility problems of this year. So if you want to have adequate protein intake across the spectrum, in terms of purely pulses, do you have any idea of how much land we need? Has anybody estimated? So this, uh, you know, you see, this is like, you know, they, it rains in Washington, our friends open their umbrellas in Kohi Kohi. You know, this does not help. You know, they, oh, we must stop consuming meat. Not in India, there. Okay, if an individual consumes too much meat, I don't care. So I think this copying of Western issues or issues that are raised in that context without appropriate acknowledgement of our circumstances is a huge problem in climate policy making and even in climate science. So for instance, I, let me give you an example from climate science you'll be familiar with. For us, our problem is not convective uh, rainfall. If you have large uh, continental spaces, convective rainfall models work very well. What is our problem with uh, uh, rainfall? Because we are governed not only by convection, but also by advection, the flow of moisture-laden uh, winds. Okay, And obviously, our uh, monsoon forecasting becomes a much harder problem. So these are at all scales. We need to think of our particular class of problems 
and not simply keep referring to oh the ipcc said the ipcc is not even a source of original research it's an assessment of published research people call them authors strictly speaking they should be called reviewers so i think uh, i cannot emphasize enough in my appeal to those who took your course especially if they are academics they are students they are technical people with expertise to pay attention to innovation and development that answer our needs let us imagine the kerala climate resilient kerala of 25 years from now i have no problem with anybody giving that slogan but what is the foundation what are the issues what is the things we should focus on without copying accepting we are in the context of the developing country called india located where we are building on our strengths what model do we have what ideas do we have for the future this is the productive way to answer these questions and not simply get into this panic mode that alarmist stuff you see coming from the west okay there is uh, time is short i agree but panic never answered a scientific issue this is my earnest suggestion thank you okay thank you if uh, uh, any of you want to take any questions from the chat box you can see or if not uh, we can conclude yeah i just wanted to say that it was a great pleasure to be with jayaram and i mean uh, his erudition on these issues is always stunning it's uh, it's teeth hurting uh, but i wanted to thank you guys for having this session and i hope that um, you know there'll be more conversation and discussion but i also want to say one more thing is i hope very much that people who have taken this series hamza and who are participating in it won't just take this series for themselves returning to the question of collective action please go out there talk to lots of people write lots of things um spur debates discussions um don't allow this to become something that just worries you i think part of this panic to action um you know cycle that jaraman is talking about is also a reflection of the individualization of the problem people sit at home and worry my god the planet is being destroyed we have to do something now well go out and do something about it talk to people uh, build discussions write um, you know uh, act in the world acting in the world in my opinion friends is the greatest antidote to panic thinking uh, because you're actually doing something you're also getting a good reflection of how difficult it is to move an agenda um, yeah. it's not as easy as just coming up with the right idea so i really want to thank uh, both jayaraman for um you know his really wisdom and then hamza for this collective um you know for spurring people to go out there and do something uh, uh thank you uh luka and kssp for this invitation and vijay <laughs> fun to be with you on this i is very good that you reminded uh, 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 reminded uh, us of uh, the words of fidel castro in fact now it is standard for all the countries in the coalition known as like minded developing countries to refer to the carbon budget in terms of carbon debt and uh, carbon uh credit okay not carbon credits as in carbon trading but in the sense of fidel castro's ecological debt in fact i had a slide which i could not show where we have actually calculated roughly the size of this debt both in physical terms and in uh, monetary term so i am putting on the uh, chat box i am putting the address hr url of our climate equity monitor uh, we talks about uh, climate uh, global climate equity in terms of the carbon budget 
you will see here a simple introduction. Maybe people in the course are already aware of it, but uh, others may also take a look at it. And uh, it is very interesting that uh, Fidel's idea of the ecological death has taken a very precise quantitative shape in the carbon budget idea, in carbon debt and credit. Unfortunately, the message is being lost in biodiversity. And so when Rwanda was so unhappy with the Kunming declaration, Kunming Montreal declaration, where they said, uh, you know, you undervalue us. And in fact, if Rwanda's stock of forests were to be evaluated in terms of the carbon that it uh, soaks every year, the carbon debt that the developed countries, and in fact, all of us owe, is in the order of tri trillions of dollars. So I think uh, the idea of Fidel's ecological debt has to be thought through again. Global stocks are the source in terms of planetary boundary. We can, I believe now, quantify and work further on the notion of the ecological debt. And this is something also that we can pursue in the future. So thanks, Vijay for uh, putting this on the agenda and thanks to uh, all of you again for your patience thank you thank you maybe we can wrap up uh, this enlightening discussion so i want to express uh, uh, my profound gratitude to our esteemed panelists uh, sharing their wisdom and uh, i would like to thank uh, luca and uh, kssp and our all our uh, audience and our i mean those who uh, took the classes i mean the course so thank you all thank you okay bye bye good night bye bye, bye. bye. see you all bye bye